message that is loud and clear and does not mince words. We've come to take our government back. You are listening to Rand Radio with Kurt Wallace. Today's podcast is brought to you by Mulligan Mint. If you add a roll of one-tenth pure silver paradigms to your order and use promo code RAND Radio, your entire purchase will receive free shipping. That's right, free shipping by using promo code RAND Radio at mulliganmint.com. That's mulliganmint.com. And now here's Kurt Wallace. Yellen has degrees from Brown and Yale taught at Harvard and got tenure at Berkeley. Her son is an economist. Her husband has a Nobel Prize in economic theory. The 67-year-old has been on the Fed for more than a decade. She's been a trailblazer for women in her field. At the highest levels in central banking, there are very few women. Wow, CNN does a great job of telling us about Janet Yellen. She's impressive, excellent resume, champion for women, Berkeley, Harvard. Sounds like the best person to be considered for the Fed. Here to help us, world-renowned investor Jim Rogers, author of Street Smarts, Adventures on the Road and in the Markets. Janet Yellen sounds like the answer to all our problems. Jim, what do you think? Wait a minute, it sounds like who's answered to all of our problems? She sounds like our problems, if you ask me. No, we've got we've had enough of these Ivy League professors who have no clue about the real world and who think that money printing is the answer to everything. I, I, I think she's part of the problem. She's certainly not the solution. Okay, so Ben Bernanke is leaving us as Fed chairman uh, on a scale of 1 to 10. How do you think he did? Uh, zero. I mean, if there were minus, he would be minus. I mean, the man has been an unmitigated disaster. He has taken the Fed's balance sheet from about $800 billion of government bonds. He's quadrupled the balance sheet. A lot of it's garbage. He's printed staggering amounts of money. I mean, Mr. Bernanke doesn't know much about currencies or economics or finance. All he knows is printing money. He spent his entire intellectual career studying the printing of money. We gave him the printing presses, and so what does he expect him to do? He ran the printing presses. That's all he knows. So, no, we're all going to pay a serious We are paying and will continue to pay a serious price. The only good news in all of this is, is, as you know, in America, we've had three central banks in our history. The first two disappeared. Um, In my view, this one's going to disappear, too, because between Mr. Greenspan and Mr. Bernanke, oh, my gosh, you know, they don't have a clue. And they've fortunately, I don't know, I shouldn't say fortunately, but one result of their actions is going to be that this central bank will disappear, too, eventually. So... The world without a central bank, America without a central bank has problems, as we've learned before, but we also know that this central bank is probably going to cause us more problems than no central bank. Well, considering that the Federal Reserve is essentially a Keynesian-style state corporatist structure, would there be anyone worth considering for Fed chairman? Oh, sure. I mean, why not Ron Paul? <laughs> he would be terrific if he would abolish it. There are people who understand the, the basic problems. The problem is, even if you could appoint Ron Paul or somebody like him, in the end, he would not be able to do what's necessary because there would be such a hue and cry that he would be thrown out or God knows what. So, yeah, there are certainly people who understand the problem, but they would not have any hope of uh, even being mentioned, much less appointed. You had a great interview with Business Insider and something that stood out to me that you said in response to what do you think the Fed chairman should be. Let me let me play that clip for you. Nobody should abolish the Federal Reserve. The world without a central bank has problems, but with this central bank, look at the people they're talking about. I mean, it's all more of the same ilk. You said the world without a central bank has problems. What do you mean? The reason we have a central bank in America and other countries is because human beings being what they are, they get carried away, get overenthusiastic at times. They lead to some people being overextended, bubbles, whatever, and then it all collapses. And then when it collapses, things get really bad. And so people said, ah, why don't we come up with the government? The government can, can help us. I'm sorry I'm laughing because it's so ridiculous. But the people said, well, let's let the government bail us all out. So they said if we had a 
government or a central bank who could be the lender of last resort, then at least the world wouldn't come to an end periodically. So that's why they came up with this concept. The original, at least in the UK in the 19th century, the guys said, okay, when there's a problem, you will be the lender of last resort. You will take only good collateral and you will lend at very high rates against that collateral until the problem passes. Now that's not a bad concept. Well, I think the world would be better off without that concept, but if you're going to have a central bank to bail out the world in times of over exuberance or when all of us humans make our mistakes, then that's not a bad policy. Unfortunately, that has since been changed dramatically, as you know, and now it's quite the opposite. The central bank is supposed to prevent slowdowns. They're supposed to prevent all sorts of things. They're sp supposed to make sure that none of us ever have any problems. That is ludicrous on its face because mankind has not changed over the past few hundred years and will not. With the world's currencies all debasing through inflation, history shows that this could be a perfect storm for a global financial collapse. With your ability to see trends as you, as you do, how does one hedge against such a scenario. Well, we're going to have a global financial collapse because of these guys. You know, we, we in the U.S. have had economic slowdowns every four to six years for the past, since the beginning of the Republic. Speaking of slowdowns, I'm on my bicycle, so if you wonder why I'm huffing and puffing, it's not because of the central bank or the slowdowns. It's because I'm exercising <laughs> at, the same, at the same time. <laughs> you know, in 2001 and two, we had a problem, and then we, we got over it, government printed a lot of money. By 2007, 8, and 9, we had our next one, which was the way it always works. And then it was worse, though, because the debt was so, so, so much higher. Well, you wait till the next one. And there is a next one coming, despite what they keep telling us. And when the next one comes, I mean, the debt has gone up by staggering amounts, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. So when the next one comes, it's going to be even worse. And let's say the world survives that one. Let's hope the world survives that one so they'll paper it over again i don't see how we will be able to survive the one after that because by then the debt will be at levels we can't even count so no we, we have to have a major shakeout gigantic catastrophe ahead of us because for decades we've all tried to prevent or postpone or kick the can down the road but you can only do that for so long because eventually the debt is so 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 high or the money printing is so, so, so rapid that it all has to collapse. You can't prevent this forever. I mean, please, it's impossible. How would one hedge against such a scenario then? A good, very good question. I struggle with it every day. I hope you do too. It will depend on how it unfolds. You have to conceivably, some currencies will be coming through this without as much damage as others, but the whole world is going to be affected. You can look at China, which is been the most successful country in the past 30 years, and they're a very large creditor. You know, the European and American and Japanese economies are 10 times bigger than the Chinese economy. So even if they do everything right, which they won't, but let's say somebody like China does everything right, it won't matter because the rest of the world is 10 times bigger. And that's going to lead to potential problems for everybody. But some currencies will be affected less than others. You can own real assets. I mean, productive farmland if you know how to farm it and you can get through the, the coming problems, turmoil. You'll probably be extremely well off if you own silver or rice. You know, if you get it at the right time, you'll probably do extremely well. Real assets historically have been the way to survive and even to prosper in times like this. But all of this, you have to get the timing right. You know, in the great German collapse in the early 20s, there were people who, most people lost fortunes. But there were people, you know, who bought the assets which were going to appreciate during the inflationary collapse. They switched, they owned stocks at the right time which went through the absolute roof in the last days of the inflation. Then they switched to U.S. dollars or pounds sterling. Some guys came out of that stinking rich. Uh, most came out of it bankrupt, as you know. We have some questions from our listeners. Joanne Fox Thomas asks, what advice would you give a young person who is looking for something to invest in? Well, Ms. Thomas, you should not listen to me or anyone else. Maybe Mr. Wallace, but not anybody else, because 
The only way you're going to be a successful investor is to invest in things about which you yourself know a great deal. Don't listen to people on TV, on the Internet, in the newspapers, because hot tips will lead you to ruin down the road. You know a lot about something. I don't know what, whether it's sports or cars or fashion. Focus on what you know, and you will find new investment ideas or new trends long before I will or anybody else. And when you find things that you know is going to to work, a thing which is going to work, do your research, do your more homework, and you'll probably buy it before anybody on Wall Street. You'll also know when to sell it because you'll know when changes are coming before people in the financial community will understand them. So that's how you get mo you make a lot of money. You don't make money listening to hot tips on the radio, on the TV, or anywhere else. Genevieve Young Brown asks, can we fix the health care health insurance problem without big government? If so, how? Well, Miss Brown, there's a classic statement, something like, oh, don't worry. I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. I'm here to solve your problems. I really cannot think of any, or certainly not many, cases where the government has solved any problem. They've usually made things worse. We were talking about central banking before. Yes, they came along. But if you look at what's happened to the value of the currency since 1913, when the American Central Bank was formed, their original mandate was to protect the value of the currency. I think you probably know the value of the currency has gone down staggering amounts since 1913. So even that solution has turned out to be a bad solution and has made many unexpected consequences. So no, I don't think we can solve the health care problem with the government. It's all really started because after the war, Second World War, there were price controls, wage controls. So companies said, well, we've got to figure out a way to give people more money. So they said, well, let's give them health benefits. Started off in a very modest way. And since then, of course, everybody in the U.S. and the world thinks that health care is free and that they can have, they can consume as much of it as they want. The new measures from the government only make that worse. You're not going to solve any problem when people think it's free. People are obviously going to consume as much as they can when it's free. There's going to be no economic restraints. And at the same time, the supply is not going to go through the roof because people aren't going to bring new supply to any endeavor unless they can make some money. No, the government's the problem. The government's only making it worse starting back in the late 1940s. Last uh, listener question. Jack of all trades is what he calls himself, asks, we hear a lot of talk about doing away with the Fed. It seems rather amorphous concept, though, especially on social media. Can you outline how it might actually work from your point of view? It's worked for hundreds of years. The idea that the world has to have central banks to repeat. For most of history, the world has not had central banks uh, and even America. For a great deal of our history, we have not had a central bank. And believe it or not, perhaps the best years of American growth were without a central bank. Certainly there were plenty of tumultuous times without the central bank in that period in the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, but we did extraordinarily well without central banks. It's only been in the past 10 years, 20 years, that central bankers have become rock stars and apparent, you know, saviors or people of infinite knowledge. 20 years ago, most people would not have known, most people still don't know there's a central bank, but very few people, even in the financial community, would have known the names of central bankers, much less being, you know, household names. 30 or 40 years ago, nobody would have known the name of the head of the central bank anywhere in the world. So the world has gotten along without them. We would certainly obviously have to have some transition again to repeat. America for most of the 19th century didn't have a central bank and until 1913. In fact, we didn't have a central bank and somehow or another, America became the most extraordinary success in the 20th century, all of which has been dissipated now, of course, under the rule of the central bank. Jim Rogers, we appreciate you being with us again. Author of Street Smarts, Adventures on the Road and in the Markets. We appreciate your time. It's always a great pleasure, Kurt. Let's do it again. You are listening to Rand Radio with Kurt Wallace.